Well, hello there, and welcome back to Fabulous Folklore Presents with Icy, where we're going to be interviewing people instead of me just simply talking at you for 15 minutes. And it is so much my pleasure in this particular interview to bring you a chat with Helen Inde, who is a Cameroonian-born researcher, writer and artist currently based in Atlanta, Georgia. She curates Mythological Africans, an online space for exploring mythology, folklore, spirituality and culture from the African continent. I've been a fan of Helen's for a while. I'm also a supporter of her Kickstarter, which we do talk about in this episode, and I hope that you'll consider supporting the project as well. And it was basically a lot of fun talking to Helen. So I hope you'll enjoy this interview as much as I enjoyed having the conversation. So hello, welcome to Fabulous Folklore Presents. Hi, nice to be here. I'm so excited. Good. Um, now, obviously, I first met you on Twitter, which is kind of where I feel like I meet most people. Yeah. And you've, been, you've been running the Mythological Africans Twitter account for a while now. So why don't you tell everybody about it and what inspired you to start it? Of course, of course. And thank you again for um, the invitation to be on the show. This is very exciting to me. Um, so Mythological Africans, how did I start it? It was it was several things, I see. So um, I was I was at a point in my life where I've been in the U.S. for some time, and I, I always say this: you, you, you see yourself a little bit differently when you live in a different country. And you know, there were questions I had about myself, and it was just at a time also in U.S. history where things were just weird, you know, with the former president and things were crazy. And I, I had a bit of an identity crisis, right? I kept looking at myself and thinking. The, the future looks so confusing, you know, what, what am I going to use to help me navigate all of that? And part of that was also kind of looking back and trying to figure out, well, who, who am I? Where did I come from? Of what stock, you know, am I? And I found that the, the, the answers I had were not satisfactory, you know, the framing around that, I found it to be a bit lacking. And so I, I decided to go look mainly for myself to say, hey, you know, what, who are my people? What are the stories that you know make us? What do we believe? How do we think we should move through the world? And that was also in the context of being online and having conversations with other people and realizing that I wasn't the only one who felt this way. So um, I, I, my initial, my initial vision for mythological Africans um, was to have this space where people like me who are not, you know, in the mainstream worldviews and beliefs and ideas could, but also who are African could have a space to see what all else, you know, we believed as African peoples of various tribes, you know, across the continent. So, um, but then I quickly became really fascinated with the, the stories, the folklore, because that's where it really begins, you know, the, the stories people tell themselves about who they are. Um, eventually shapes them into who they are. So I found myself really caught up in all of this. And I thought, you know, of course, I want to share this with people. And how can I share this in the most meaningful and relevant and engaging way? And it was just to keep telling stories, you know, telling the old stories and finding ways to tell the new stories. So I, I created the Mythological Africans platform, you know, as this place to explore folklore, myths from the African continent, but also the cultures out of which they come, the worldviews out of which they come, because these stories do not exist in a vacuum. So this is a bit of a long-winded answer, but that, that was really kind of like the, the process that, that led me towards this. And, um, and I'm glad I did. It's been, it's been quite the right so far. Excellent. I know it's one of those things, I think, when you, you decide you want to share folklore. So I think it's always that, where do I start moment as well? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so how did you decide where you wanted to start with everything? Well, I had I had this idea in my head that I was going to write a book about Cameroon, my country, country I come from. So I spent the good part of a year um, looking at, you know, what's going on here. So I, I did research into the creation myths and like worldviews, what people believe. I looked at the folklore, so the myths, the songs, the chants and dances and all of that. I looked at um, more cultural type practices, you know, divination and ceremonies and rites of passage and things like that. I look at food and dream culture. And this was all, you know, to write the book. So this was me doing research and writing chapters. And I basically wrote, you know, a rough first draft of this thing. And but then what that gave me was, you know, 
references, things to poke into, a, a, a framework to work with, you know, because if I start by looking at creation myths and worldviews and then wider, you know, folklore, I look at cultural practices, food, drink, and all of that. It, it gave me something for Cameroon in particular, the different peoples, different African peoples who are in the country called Cameroon. And then it was easy to step out of that, say, okay, what are the creation myths elsewhere? What are the types of folklore elsewhere? What are the food and drink and marriage and all of that? And it's, it, it kind of branched out from there. And um, I, I'm glad I did it that way because this started out as a personal search for me. This was me trying to make sense of my own roots. Um, and it, it sort of set me up for how to approach things elsewhere with you know, references, but also books to read and you know people to turn to for, for answers. So it, I, I think I think I came at it in a way that that you know set me up quite well. Excellent. Yeah. So I know this is probably like, you know, the thing we have to choose what your favorite or who your favorite child is. <laughs> but if you had to choose sort of like a couple. Uh, which would you say the stories that you've kind of shared on Twitter, would you say are the ones that you most wish people knew about? Oh man, that is a hard question because the different, different stories bring, you know, different things. I mean, I, I can talk about some characters and ideas, which, you know, just blew me away when I first heard about them. The first being the, the enfant terrible character. Um, and this, this is a character that shows up in a lot of African folklore is this, it's basically the, the, problem child, you know, in many ways, but sometimes it's good problems, sometimes it's bad problems. And um, so they, they cause a lot of trouble, they cause a lot of upheaval, but then that usually results in the community changing for the better, the community realizing something or some kind of tyrant getting kicked out. And there are so many of such stories about these characters. They are woven in a lot of the mythology and folk of African people than I, I, that's definitely a character I think should get more attention. And of course I did a talk about it, which was quite fun, which was quite fun. Um, but then also, and we'll talk a bit more about this later, just the women, like it, it has been just incredible running into the different women of African mythology and folklore. Um, if you are in these circles, you know, you, you, you get pretty familiar very fast, you know, with Yoruba mythology and the pantheons and all of that. Um, but Outside of that, there are just so many stories of so many women, um, you know, spirits, goddesses, regular women who do these amazing things. And they, they, they have so many different faces, you know, they're not all, you know, good princesses that need saving. You know, there are these complex characters, you know, some of them based on historical figures. So uh, definitely, do and I'm not giving specific stories here because it's just, I, I don't think I could do that. But Definitely, you know, the infanteries, the women of various tribes, um, but also just the epics as well. Like, you know, the Sondieta epic, for example, is very well known, and the, the Mwindo epic um, is another better known African epic. But underneath all of that, there are all these stories that, you know, get bring in these wide range of characters and situations. And there's, there's just so much going on that I, I, I would say the whole body of folklore in and of itself. Um, absolutely deserves deserves more attention and which is what makes you know curating the platform such a pleasure because there's always something I am getting excited about yeah so that's actually one of the things I wanted to ask you about because there's been this huge boom of interest in sort of folklore and mythology mm -hmm. in the last few years um and I think obviously in some places it kind of gets as far as like Greek mythology and Norse myth and then sort of stops uh-huh but then obviously I can think of like tons of podcasts, which are obviously focusing on these tales from other regions. Mm -hmm. So are you hopeful that the interest is spreading beyond like the really obvious European ones now? I think so. And I hope it continues to, because my theory is that I wasn't the only one having that identity crisis that drove me in this direction. Usually when there is um, upheaval at the community level, like we see at the community at the global level now, there is people trying to make sense of it all. And many of us will turn to the stories that, you know, we, we know. And I think that the, the, the interest in folklore other than the, the major European ones is, is important because a huge part of the upheaval which we're seeing now is because the rest of the world is really, you know, even more because we're connected now with the internet, people are saying, hey, there's a lot of things that happened in the past that 
were not right. You know, a lot of ideas that people were forced to adapt to survive. But, you know, those are not the only stories out there. So if we're really going to live in a world where everybody has a chance to be happy, we have to take everybody's story into consideration. And I think that's what's under this, you know, resurgence of interest in myth and folklore from all over the world, not just, you know, Europe and, and, and like Scandinavia and all of that. And I think it's great. I think it's great because what, what we will need, in my opinion, for the future is a story about humanity that brings everybody in. You know, that's not just, you know, Rome, Roman mythology or Greek or Scandinavian or, the, or you know, Indian and, and I don't know, a Nancy story that sneaks in there. Like we, we need a story about human be humanity that reflects everything that we've been through. And that's that's what we're figuring out how to do now. And this this interest in folklore and mythology is a part of it. That's, I think that's I think I, I see it that way. Do you think that it's possibly kind of happening in the current moment as well because the likes of sort of podcasting and social media are a lot more accessible to a lot <laughs> more people that it's sort of yeah. it's taken it away from like academia and kind of put it back in the hands of ordinary people. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I, I mentioned the internet having connected us before. That's 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 really it. You know, you have all these ways in which people can hear about each other, people can connect with each other, people can talk with each other, and to do it so creatively through storytelling, through you know videos and and art and all these ways that we are we're now in touch with each other. I feel like we're it's it's a term that gets thrown around, but we really are forging a global village. You know where. And, and what keeps a community together is what they believe about themselves. And, and that, that, that process is in, in the works, you know. Um, they're the bigger myth-making machines like, you know, Hollywood and all of that. But I think at the podcast, you know, in the uh, independent creator level, there is still, there's like a, 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 a rich work going on there of people, you know, saying, hey, these are all the stories or these are alternates to what the, the bigger machines are telling us. And that's it's, it's a beautiful ecosystem to be a part of because it's it's important for what, what's happening, what, what people are doing. So, yes, absolutely. I, I think uh, the growth of social media on the podcast and, you know, YouTube channels and TikToks and all of that um, have been helpful for getting people to a wider audience, but also getting some of these stories to a wider audience. I think that's the thing, because when I think about when I first started, I mean, I discovered podcasts really late, like I was quite a late adopter of them. And I think when I first sort of encountered them, a lot of them were sort of obviously the British ones. And then when I started spotting, you know, ones like the Afro Tales podcast and <laughs> Drafts, Eggs and Other Tales and, and ones like that, I was kind of like, oh, wow, these are all stories that I've never <laughs> had the chance to be exposed to before. So I think it is really good that you get a listen because obviously in some cases you're like oh wow that's actually really similar so we're not mm -hmm. that different after all yeah. and other times you come across these amazing characters and he's like oh wow this is so cool so i have <laughs> so found it really uh really kind of oh, i don't want to use the word enlightening but i found it really sort of nice to be able to then have empathy with it with with people mm -hmm. i think in a different way because you're exposed to like a, a wider range of storytelling mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. absolutely absolutely and and I, I really like that you talk about the the connection that comes out of it, you know, the capacity, the increased capacity for empathy, because we're going to need that, you know, it, it, looking at the future we are going towards. I, I feel sometimes like everything hinges, like desperately hinges on us coming back to the realization that we're all we've got. You know, this is it. <laughs> The people you're on earth with right now, the people you're on earth with right now, we can either make it work or we can set ourselves up, you know. And what a beautiful way to do that then through recognizing that the same stories you told yourself, you know, you see the world the way I do, and it's so similar that we are telling ourselves the same story. <sighs> How cool is that? You know, and you are in the Philippines. <laughs> no, and I am in Cameroon. It just it blows my mind every single time, and I think there is there is just so much potential for good things to come out of that. And yeah, yeah. So this is probably going to be a hard question to answer, <laughs> but where do you think the line is between mythology and folklore, or is there no line at all? Mm. 
So when I read this question, I, I sat and thought about it for a while and I got my idea in my head. And then I went online to be like, what is the difference between mythology and folklore? Like, how are people? And I, I think the answer I found online very much aligned with how I think about it. So I think of mythology as sort of the... <sighs> I'm trying to use a metaphor and an analogy here. So if you have a body, like a human body or an animal body or a plant, I think of mythology and folklore as like the skeleton, the, the structure, right? The basic structure, the basic, what creates the balance and, you know, the framework upon which everything else rests. So the, the basic, how did this get there? The creator gods, the, the philosophies, all of that, how that weaves into a story. And then the folklore bits are like the skin, the hair, the, the, the blood vessels, the, the little, you know, not, not the little, little, but, you know, the other parts that come together to create this body of a culture, of a people, of, of a community. And, but then you can't have a body of flesh without bone or bone without flesh. And, and that's how like mythology and folklore weave into each other because out of mythology, spills folklore but also you can't have the mythology without the folklore the little stories that give that that god god or goddess or creative be creator being explains them even more makes them more accessible so i'm probably starting to ramble here <laughs> that's, that's that's how i think about it so mythology as the organizing ideas the framework the general you know way of being in the world and in folklore as what what get what makes it interesting what makes it you know the spice and variety you know and and how that that entity has responded to different experiences with new things so it's the little scar you have in the body from that time when you you know cut yourself or um the way your accent changed a little bit because you moved to a new country or the, the different way you dress now because you saw something like folklore is, is are these little variations to to how that body presents itself. And I hope all of that makes any kind of sense at all. <laughs> it does, it does, because I think I always kind of thought like is folklore sort of like the little stories that people tell each other like on more or less like a daily basis kind of thing, which over mm. time kind of coalesce into myth. But then I was like, am I, am I just like making that up? Because I think it's it's one of those things I always find quite interesting when people repeat a myth, but then they're really, really careful to tell you, oh, but this isn't history. And I'm like, but where's the line between mythology and history? Right, right, <laughs> right, right, right. Because it, it was it was it was a realization I had, like, oh my gosh, when people didn't have writing, for example, they used these stories to to make sense of things that were happening. And this process started thousands of years ago thousands like thousands thousands of years ago so of course we'll hear some characters now and they're gonna sound like gods because i mean can you imagine how far back this goes you know and people are still figuring things out and how this world works and some people were the first ever to figure certain things out so of course it seemed like they had magical knowledge but also who knows what is all out there i see like <laughs> who knows what people have experience of the the infinitesimal of the supernatural of just you know i was reading a tweet earlier um today where someone said people seem confused when someone who's into the hard sciences is so religious and believes in god is because the more you dig into certain things the more you understand just how incomprehensible <laughs> you know life is like how is all of this even possible how are you and i sitting right here right now having this conversation like you know so who knows what the human experience has been who knows what people have seen and heard and of course it's going to be reflected in our stories because it's it's a mystery in many ways it really is i know i often wonder when you sort of think of the idea of like the gods and humans and i always think well there's an age-old thing among like developers in particular, uh, specifically, uh, especially web developers, where anything works until you give it to people to actually use. Mm. And it is like that kind of age old thing where every design is fine until it encounters the end user. In the think, real world. Yeah. And you think, does the gods ever look at humans and go, 
you weren't supposed to do that. That wasn't actually what we had in mind, but you've just gone and done your own thing. Oh, no. I often wonder if they're kind of just like, oh, the whole time of everything <laughs> that we're doing. <laughs> it's funny you put it that way because um, that exactly, you have the framework, right? This is, this is how it's supposed to work. And then it encounters the real world and, you know, things get a little bent out of shape and then suddenly something comes out of it. And that's what people run with because it works. I, I, that is an excellent analogy because exactly the developers have this thing in mind and then it encounters the real world and suddenly it's buggy. (laughs) It's full of bugs that perhaps the developers hadn't considered when they were putting it together. And it's that encounter with the real world that, that refines it, that gives it the, the, stuff that makes it so much fun to be a part of you know that is an excellent I, I might use that analogy sometimes <laughs> yeah just feel free i just i just think it's quite <laughs> funny the idea of them looking got humans are they a feature or a bug <laughs> you know you know <laughs> some people would argue and say we're a bug right now you know messing with the running of things on the planet but sometimes it's the bug that shows you you know something about the system that you might not have considered before so we, we hope we're the good kind of bugs, you know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, definitely. We hope um, so. <laughs> I've just got visions of the gods kind of shaking heads going, oh, God, not again. Not again. <laughs> like, oh, didn't they learn last time? Come on. You're going to start another world war? Like, come on. <laughs> like, when will they ever learn? <laughs> have, have you learned nothing from all the wars we have fought amongst ourselves? Have you learned nothing? <laughs> Maybe that's what the folklorists are for. Where can you yeah. translate as you go <laughs> done this before? <laughs> oh, oh uh, my goodness. Um <sighs> speaking of that then, because obviously we've got quite a lot of films, I think, which flirt with mythology. I'm I'm, I'm gonna say what I'm thinking of the Thor films, like you know, the look mm-hmm. at the Norse myth and kind of right, wander right. around it a little bit and then go off in a different direction. But then we also get films like The Woman King, which has just come mm-hmm. out, at least I know in the UK it has. Do you think there's a risk that people might try to then learn their history from sort of fiction rather than history? <laughs> um and if so, can folklorists do anything to help? Or is it the kind of thing where people just need to learn what nuance means? <laughs> Oh my gosh. So I, I I think about this a lot, especially with, you know, movies like The Woman King coming out because um, these, these movies, you know, big budget Hollywood movies command a lot of attention um, and this can, this can be for better or worse, right? And I think there is, to an extent, it's unavoidable that people will learn certain things from the big budget movies. But then that's where this ecosystem of podcasters and YouTubers and bloggers and all these these people who exist, that's where we can really show, demonstrate, you know, what what we have to offer. And that exactly has been happening with The Woman King, because the I don't know how much you know about the story. The movie itself is a fictional account that, you know, borrows from, but it's not true to actual history. But because of that, there has been this amazing conversation online about what really happened in this kingdom. Why did things happen this way? You know, and could it have been different? Could it be different in the future? And there is a lot that is coming out of it because at least from where I sat, um, you know, I organized the event to talk about the movie. So that that meant really a deep dive into this topic. And I came out of it, you know, with, uh, outside of just the outrage and the grief of you know the the tragedy of that time with a renewed you know appreciation for for humanity for african peoples for the road that we have walked to get to this point because my god i see things have happened (laughs) you know things have happened people have done things people have experienced things um and we we have to figure out a way to talk about it somehow so the movie is one way to to bring the topic to the forefront because it's an incredibly difficult topic. You know, there are people alive today whose lives were irrevocably changed by some of these events and not for the better. You know, um, the, the movie is a way to 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 put the topic on the table, and then we all kind of come at it in different ways and talk about it, and you know, maybe create the the the, the platform for a new 
way to move into the future at least that's how i'm looking at it because i don't want to get stuck at the level of oh the movie is fake this is what actually happened in history because i i can't change what happened in history i can't change the movie but what i can do is say hey this is all the stuff that happened and how can we orient ourselves towards the future with this in mind and that's that's what i think that the the, the big stories have to offer um it happened with you know the whole can a mermaid be black you know thing because a lot of stories came out of it to say hey it's not as fixed as you think these are beliefs that are ever shifting and being influenced and at the end of the day at least from where i stand what are they revealing about who we are and how we could be you know that's that's where it matters because you look at even the original um, um, um little mermaid story hans christian anderson was expressing something there you know but then that expression was an outpouring from his real life which also had other dimensions you know he, he was a complex human being from what i can hear that's you know, putting it kindly <laughs> You know, so there is there is a lot of what is good that can come out of all this if we if we go at it, you know, differently, and that's happening, and I'm and I'm glad to see that. Mm. Does that answer your question at all? Because I feel like I go off on these tangents. No, it it, it did. And I know it was quite funny because I know that I think the the one of the few sections of the internet that I hang out in a lot, which sort of went bring it on about the new Little Mermaid, was the folklorist because of that mm. awareness that mermaids are all over the world right, right. so many different cultures and the number of people I kept seeing going oh it's not like the original meaning the Hans Christian Anderson one I'm like well I don't remember you getting annoyed at Disney for changing the ending of the story because that's a film that I think somebody should make right. um, and so yeah it was it was funny how you know some people obviously had their ridiculous prejudice against it and I'm like you know she can sing that's pretty much the only qualification and she can swim underwater that's really the only qualifications that you need yeah. and it, it 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 was quite interesting that the folklorists at least had that slightly wider perspective uh-huh. but i think that there's other other issues uh with disney in general that i think obviously people have, have overlooked but there we go i think it has been interesting i think because i've seen quite a lot of conversations about the woman king in particular where mm-hmm. people have expressed like a really sort of simplistic one dimensional view and then someone else has gone actually did you know this though and then they've sent them a link and then the person's gone oh thanks and then they go off and look at it so I think it there's quite a lot of people who are really generous with resources on online which <laughs> hopefully I mean, some people will continue to believe their own thing but right you know you can't do that anything about these people but I think other people who are prepared to go oh I now have new information that I can fold into my world right um, well, hopefully yeah. then they'll go and share that with other people and, you know, I suppose kind of critical thinking goes viral eventually. <laughs> hey, we need more of that, don't we? Critical <laughs> thinking going viral because, good Lord, it gets it dicey out there. It does. Yeah, it, uh, it really is. And actually that takes me on to another one of my questions. Obviously, because a lot of what connects sort of like you and I and, you know, our whole community and so on is obviously like a love of stories I think and mm-hmm. like a desire to help preserve them and a desire to share them and, and things like that um and I think it's quite interesting when you then look at the way that short form video is, is sort of which isn't necessarily always like referenced particularly well and I'm thinking of the whole marinating chicken and cough syrup thing here um do you think that humans will always express themselves through stories or do you think things like TikTok and what have you are eroding that or are they just changing the format? You know, I think it's just changing the format. Like I read this beautiful book uh, the other last year, The Spell of the Centuries by David Abrams. And he, he was talking about humanity's transition from oral oral um oral orality, you know, preserving through stories, preserving preserving stories through talking about them to writing, you know, and how that just fundamentally changed even how we see the world. And I see the progression towards short form videos and GIFs and memes and all of that as just, you know, a continuation of this path, which offers a little bit more because you you think about, um, you know, stories were told and a lot of the times it would just be, you know, this is happening and this is happening and this is happening. And then reading came into it and you could get more into people's heads and, you know, get in, 
read about what someone was feeling and realize, oh, that's what I was feeling, you know, and, and it just, it completely changed how you relate to the world. And then now you have these, you know, a meme, which in so few images communicates so much. <laughs> You know, a, a meme can communicate a whole philosophical worldview that people have written volumes about, you know, and then you have, you know, the TikToks, which I, I think of TikTok sometimes as a, 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 a video format of, uh, I don't know, a, a Salvador Dali painting, you know, just things completely going everywhere, but then still coming together to communicate something. And it's just it's just communication evolving in different ways and people bringing in together all the different ways in which you communicate because you have sometimes like the words, the images doing the thing you hear, you see the colors and I think it's just communication evolving into something different and it's hilarious how it's happening because it's in a totally unserious way <laughs> when you, you think about some of the things you see on the internet, but I think that's the beauty of it, you know how just the creativity that comes with being human. I, I think it's it's changing, you know, how we process information, how we take in information, and it's not going to be adapted for certain things, you know. Um, there is only so much about the nuances of internalized racism, for example, that that a, a short TikTok video can com communicate. But if, if you can get that hook, if you can get someone feel that flare of, huh, oh wow and drop a few words in there that they can go google and look up and dig up more literature that's something because there's just so much out there already you know so it's it's an evolution it's it's changing but there's still so much potential for for what is good there um and why we need people who care about these things out there you know creating i hate this word content you know we need people who care about these things out there creating this this material and yeah it's again what makes being part of this ecosystem so exciting and so rewarding mm. speaking of content if i can use the same <laughs> word um, obviously you're also doing a book as well which i'm very I, excited uh, about because obviously I've, I've already supported you on kickstarter yes you have thank yes. you so much um tell everyone about it all right so um the book is called The Runaway Princess and Other Stories, and it is a collection of folk tales, um, legends, myths from different African peoples, um, but focused on the girls and the women, because something, a couple of things, there are amazing stories out there. There are they're just women who, you know, they're, there, there is this uh, a perception of African women, and it comes out of years and years of you know things going crazy, that it can get really one-dimensional or multi-dimensional, but in a very weird and confusing way. And what I found in folklore was that it was it was a, a, a nice you know hardier, solid, more solid, chunkier you know better kind of multi multi-dimensional. I I found because you have you know, yes, there's the queens and, you know, their mothers and sisters and daughters, you know, the standards. But beyond all of that, you have these women who made decisions, took risks, you know, um, tried things, failed at things, you know, just utterly failed at things <laughs> in some cases. Um, messed things up royally sometimes, you know, got things right, you know. And I thought to myself, what a, what, what, what a life people have lived, what stories people have had. But something I also found interesting, and you know this because you know folklore, what happens is you just, you get the story. This person went here and did this and this happened and this is how it was resolved. And every now and then you hear that they laughed or they smiled or they cried or they felt grief or they felt sorrow. But you don't get that inner monologue. You don't get that sense of, okay, this is what they were thinking. This is what they were feeling. This is how they reflected on the experience. So the, the approach I'm taking with the book is telling the stories of these different women but telling it from like you know, their perspective. So there are quite a few of the stories are told in the first person. You know, this, this is what I was thinking, I was seeing, I was feeling. Um, but also just focus on their, their, the way they saw things, their understanding, their interpretation, their reactions. And, and that has been fascinating because obviously, you know, I have, what I did was I divided the African continent into North, South, East, West, and Central. 
and then I try to grab three stories from each region. But even then, you know, it's just a, a, a tip of the iceberg of the different peoples and cultures out of which these stories come. So the, the challenge is understanding the culture out of which the story comes, understanding, you know, what women expected of themselves, what the culture expected of the women, what men expected of the women, getting into that psychological mindset so that the, the reflections that the, the people have would be true to the environment, but also just getting to the human kernel of it. You know, if I were a woman born in these circumstances, and this is what you know shaped my upbringing. How would I feel about this? You know, but then there is also a, a strong element of um, looking at events and being only able to react to them based on how I'm experiencing the world right now. So it's just this interesting line of you know telling the story, being true to the story, but you know trying to get into the character's head and offering that, and also just getting some art too because that's a huge part of the book, um, commissioning art because. Something you'll find is that for all the stories that are in African folklore, there's just not enough art images to, to depict, you know, different characters, the different scenarios, the different people. I always say, you know, you, you could Google Snow White or Cinderella and you'll get thousands of ways in which these, these characters have been depicted. And you'd be lucky if you got one of, of I don't know, Yenenga, who's a, a huge figure, you know, the titular character for the book, though she is a runaway princess. Um, so it's it's bringing all of that together. And a lot of it is coming out of, you know, just being immersed in the world of African folklore recently. Um, yeah, let me, let me stop there if you have any questions, because I could go on and on and on and on about this book, because I'm really excited about it. I know when you mentioned the art, I remember when I first saw the cover and I said to you, oh my God, that's yeah. gorgeous. Like that yeah. artist is so talented. It is, he is. And, and that, that has been the other amazing part of, of working on this project because many, for a few of these artists, this was really their first encounter with some of these characters. So, so you, I, I got to see their own excitement, you know, because I, I, I would send them the stories and they would read them because like, whoa. <laughs> didn't know this like wow dang okay I didn't know people got down like that and then they would put so much of themselves into it you know their own ideas um and and that was important for me to not be too too insistent about what I wanted to see but to give them the chance to to visualize things in their own ways and I've just been blown away I see blown away by by what people have come up with you know because you you see you see the world through another person's eyes, you know. I, I I might look at a character and have something in mind. And then the artist sends me their first draft and it's just it's so different. And I'm like, I love this. I love this. I would never have thought to imagine her this way. And she is perfect. Perfect. You know? So <laughs> that that has been that has been the absolutely the the, the best part of all of this. And um, the the idea that this could keep going is why I'm really 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 hoping that um, I, I get you know funded because I'm running a Kickstarter as you know um, to 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 make the book happen because with funding then I can pay more artists and like I have it all outlined I know who I want to do what and I just I just need to reach out to these people and say hey are you are you down um, so I, I'm really hoping this all comes together because it, it's going to be so good it's going to be so good I'm having so much fun working on it and i i know people will have fun and engaging with it so yeah I, like i said i could go on and on about this book right now i i really could but it's... Well, i'm gonna ask you a really horrible question then oh no a favorite story in the book ah oh my gosh <laughs> so this is a horrible question it's like asking me to choose between my kids ah do I a couple I think that's that's as good as I can go and without disclosing too much the the characters I have felt the most drawn to have been the ones who really embody the the multi-dimensionality right so there are characters who are just they have so much love but then they mess things up so terribly, <laughs> you know? And there are characters who are everything, you know, you would, you, would, you, would, you would imagine someone in their position would be, but one thing just doesn't work out, you know? 
and there are characters for whom everything just aligns and they you know ride the wave to glory and and it's perfect so yeah i i have a couple of uh, the titular character for example um is based on uh, an actual historical figure or straddles that line between myth and history because these are real people who existed you know their their, their story is encoded in the oral traditions of the 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 people out of which they call Yaninga. Um, she's a runaway princess. Um, but there are different versions to her story, different versions to how things unfolded. So, but but it all boils down to the fact that this was a girl who, you know, I, I was looking at the outline I wrote for her and what, what I wrote down was a deeply feminine consciousness which has been groomed into being a weapon and now has to reconcile those two bits because her story is she was the eldest daughter, the princess of a kingdom. And from a young age, she showed a high aptitude for battle, you know, strategy, fighting and all of that. Um, and she was so good. She got drafted into her dad's army and became a captain and then a general, had her own battalion. And she was so good, so good. Her dad wouldn't let her marry, which, you know, if you know anything about African societies, it's like, uh, huh, what? <laughs> what that's like the the holy grail for most women in most societies to get married and and not always in a bad way because there's that aspect of continuity you know the, it was about community growing and you know so but then she wants to marry she wants to have children you know you have this warrior this freaking warrior you know this beast on the battlefield and she just wants to marry and have babies and her dad wouldn't let her like her story has always blown my mind like wow <laughs> You know, so like now getting into her head, you know, getting into her head and being like, what was she feeling? What was, like when she planned her escape, you know, what was going through her head? And then she meets a hunter in the forest and they fall in love and like, it, it's like, yeah. You know, so she's, I, I love her, you know, she's my main character, like she's the runaway princess. And then there are other characters who just do things, man. I don't want to give too much away. so. Yeah, I, I am having a lot of fun getting to know these women in different ways. And yeah, it's it's it, it's a fun process. It really is. Well, I'm really excited about it. No pressure. <laughs> um, so how can people find you online and engage with your work and obviously find you on Kickstarter and help support the book? Of course. Um. So a lot of what I do is on Twitter. So the Mythological Africans page is at Mythic Africans. And from there, um, you can get to the Mythological Africans website, which right now um, in the, on the profile, you will get access to the Kickstarter instead, because that's what we have going on. But there is a Mythological Africans website from which it's like the landing pad. And from there, you can get to the YouTube page. Um, on, on YouTube, I do what I call a deep dive series. So I'll pick a topic and just find out as much as I can about how different African peoples view or you know practice whatever it is and just talk about it. So I have a bunch of deep dive episodes on YouTube. Um, we looked into, you know, sun symbolism, moon and star symbolism. Um, we've looked at other worlds and underworlds, women, societies, divination practices. And we just recently started a deep dive into sexual practices. So sexuality as a whole, um, we did an episode on that. And we did an episode on intersexuality and then um, we just the last episode we did was on heterosexuality so the practices what people did and we still have um episodes to go on um uh gay and lesbian communities and all of that and how people navigated all of that because there was a lot going on there you know something sometimes what on the surface looks like a, a, a lesbian relationship was actually not that you know women would have relationships with each other but not like in that way and there, there there can be a lot of confusion around that and then also there were lesbian relationships that you know even till today persist but then because they are not understood in the same way as within the western framework you would have people say hey no we are not lesbians <laughs> you know so there, there is a lot going on there and i i, I do deep dives on that um, on youtube and there's also a blog where every now and then I'll throw a few thoughts out. And if you go to the blog right now, there's an excerpt from, from the book on there. So go check it out. Um, and then, but on Twitter, I will do, you know, I'll participate in the, the daily uh, mythology and folklore community um, activity. So Mythology Monday, Fairytale Tuesday, and 
um, Weird Wednesday and Folklore Thursday and, you know, Fush and Friday or Off Dark and Macabre and every now and then Superstition Saturday and Swamp or Folklore Sunday. Um, there's also the Twitter spaces that I do. So every Friday evening, which we have one coming up today, um, Friday evenings we'll get together and um, just read stories and talk about them. So you, you can, so from Twitter, you can get to the Kickstarter for the book. Um, you can also, in a bit, when the Kickstarter is over, get back to the website um, to get to the blog, the YouTube page. Um, on the on the uh, Mythological Africans page as well, you can access the talks that I have given, recorded talks, um, where which I've given. And also, if you have a research request, something you want to be investigated from the African continent, I offer that service as well, the paid service. So um, Twitter really is the hub, and from there you can just you can get access to everything, including the Kickstarter, the Kickstarter campaign. So obviously I'll put links in the show notes and stuff right. to kind yeah. of send people on their way. Right, right, right. Yeah, I'll be like your bouncer lot. online. <laughs> huh? I'll be like your bouncer online, guys. <laughs> like, okay, to go. <laughs> this way, ma'am. <laughs> that way, ma'am. Can yeah. I see your oh. ticket, please? <laughs> Yeah, I was just I'm I'm really excited about the book, and you do put so much stuff online. It's it it's it's incredible how much you actually sort of give people, which is good. But yeah, people should definitely check you out and support your work as well because of what you're doing. Thank you, thank you. It is my absolute pleasure. It really is. Well, it's been really fun talking to you. I've really enjoyed this. I um, have too, and like doing it live, and but you know, we'll see hi on the timeline every now and then. But this 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 has really been so good. I'm so glad. I got to do this and thank you for the invitation. Yeah, my pleasure. As I say, I just really hope that the book gets funded. So I'm going to just start hounding people to support, you know. <laughs> I appreciate it. I appreciate it. My pleasure. Well, thanks for listening. And I hope you enjoyed that episode. If you did, feel free to leave a review wherever you listen to podcasts because that helps other people find the show too. It also takes between four and six hours to research, write, record, and edit these episodes. So if you want to help support my time in doing that, then you can buy me a coffee. Or you can join the Fabulous Folklore family on Patreon and enjoy extra benefits, including exclusive episodes and articles and even illustrated talks. All the links you need are below and thanks in advance. <laughs>